So again, another warm welcome to everyone as you're joining us today. My name is Carrie, and just a couple of things before we get started. You will receive a link to the certificate of attendance, presentation slides, and the recording by end of day tomorrow or, or Thursday. We'll be sending that out via email. Usually the title of that email is linked to our session title, and that'll be Double Jeopardy, the factors that keep ELLs from reaching their true potential. So you'll see an email come through your email box. Right now, you can take a look at the icons at the bottom of your screen. There is a green resources tab that has the presentation slides and um, a certificate of attendance right there. Um, we also have a survey icon at the bottom of your screen. And please share your thoughts with, the, with us about the webinar. On the very right-hand side of your, the bottom of your screen, there's a little um, chain link. And that's actually a link to tomorrow's webinar if you want to register. Uh, Feel free to join us at 1 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. Now, in order to get us started today, I'm going to introduce Dr. Martha Burns. She's our presenter for the webinar today. She is a joint appointment professor at Northwestern University and has authored three books and over 100 journal articles on the neuroscience of language and communication. Dr. Burns' expertise is in all areas related to the neuroscience of learning, such as language and reading in the brain, the bilingual brain, the language to liter literacy continuum, and the adolescent brain. Dr. Burns is also a fellow of the American Speech Language Hearing Association and the Director of Neuroscience Education at Scientific Learning Corporation. Please help me welcome Dr. Martha Burns. Thank you, Carrie, and welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to have you, and welcome to the new school year. Um, I'm sure we're all excited to get going. Uh, we're going to just start with a little bit of data on the number of students now in the United States in the public schools that are classified as English language learners. I don't know if you realize that 10% of the students now are classified as English language learners, and that's increased by 14% over the past decade. So to get started and to help me to understand you better, I'd like to look at um, and I, let's make sure that you're on the same slide I am. Um, Carrie, are, are the slides moving as I'm going? I'll do it this way, I think, then I'm sure they are. So um, let's start with a uh, poll that helps me to understand you and my listeners and what you're concerned about. So in this slide, it says, what is your greatest area of concern regarding ELL achievement? Um, are the students not moving quickly enough in English levels? Um, are the students uh, having basic interpersonal English but are struggling with academic language? Do you have more ELL students, English language learners, coming into your school every year and you're not exactly sure how to help them, or all of the above? Go ahead and click on one of those and then just press the Submit button and we'll be able to look at your responses. So it says that for most of you, um, it's all of above, all of the above, uh, about 60%. So that helps me. And then the other majority of you say the students have some interpersonal English language, but they're struggling to develop um, academic language. So um, let's move on and just look at Hispanic children in terms of the general imperatives that we have. Um, of all of the English language learners, I'm sure most of you are aware, and this was research published by Garcia and Jensen in 2009, Hispanic children who speak English as their first language make up the largest proportion of ELL students in today's schools, and that's based on the last uh, Census Bureau. So Hispanics are the largest and fastest growing minority group in the United States, they have disproportionately high numbers who live in poverty, and that's really where this double jeopardy comes in. These students are students who are struggling with two things, struggling with, obviously with academic language and learning in English, but they're also um, coming from homes of poverty. And as a group, Hispanic children struggle with poor educational achievement. 
So often the students have a high proportion of un unidentified learning disabilities as well. This is research that was published by um, IES just a few years ago, and it said standardized test scores alone can't distinguish between learning disabilities and other factors, such as the student's low level of proficiency or um, limited poor schooling. So, so oftentimes what happens is these students are missed because in terms of identifying them um, correctly as either learning disabled or in sometimes they're over identified as learning disabled simply because it's so difficult to test them accurately. Now let's look again at the next poll and let me know based on your school district data or based on your experience, which seems to be the case in your setting that English language learners are under identified for special ed services or over identified for um, for special ed services. Click on the, the button there and then just click the submit button and we'll take a look at that next slide. And it says most of you are finding they're under identified and I would say that that is probably typical. About two thirds of you say yes they're under identified but occasionally they are identified as learning disabled um, when in fact that isn't the primary issue that we have. So. All of these, we could almost call it a triple jeopardy for, for many of these students. They have the English language barrier, they, have the, they come from homes of poverty, and they also um, are not perhaps getting the special services that they might need if they are um, in fact learning disabled. Now let's look at second language learning now and see how the brain um, util utilizes two different languages. Second language learning affects the way the brain's organized for language. It's actually a very good thing to have a second language. You probably know that. Um, but it differs dependent upon when the second language is learned. And also, there is this critical period of development um, that is that is going to require about the same length of time, whether a child is going to learn language early in life or whether they're going to learn it later, takes a certain amount of time to be able to master a second language. And so to get started, let's look at the research of Dr. Joy Hirsch. She's at Columbia University. And several years ago, this is almost 20-year-old um, data now, she looked at um, adults who had learned a second language after they were school age, so um, we call that after the critical period of learning a language because it's usually around six or seven years of age. So after they entered school or before they entered school. Um, and we would call that during the critical period. And you can see on the left, you see the after the critical period, you see that that they have two languages that are represented in this language area of the brain that we call Broca's area, that area of the brain you can see there's a red section and a yellow section, and those two are clearly separated. And what that means is that when a child is learning, or when any of us learn a second language after we enter school, the two languages are stored separately and, and utilized separately. So you're, the individual is always going to translate from their native language into the second language, and that takes time. And it also is going to take time to carve out that region of the brain and build it up for the second language. Now on the right side, you see what happens if someone's exposed to a second language before they enter school. In those cases, they're called true bilinguals because the whole language area overlaps. Most of it's orange, meaning that they don't have to translate. They just have one big giant language of, that contains the set of phonemes from one, speech sounds from one language, set of speech sounds from the other language, all the vocabulary of the two languages, and they can go back and forth between the two. They can switch between the two very easily and think in both languages. Now, for most of us, our students are going to be learning the second language after they enter school. They might have been exposed to it on television, but one of the things we know is that television doesn't really build language skills very well. But the brain is wired for language, and learning language is the way the whole left hemisphere starts to mature um, 
in in all literate societies. So so at birth we have this equal to potential to learn any language. I'm sure you all know that. But by five to six months the brain has already started to specialize for the language that the child is exposed to in the home. And if both parents speak Spanish or both parents speak the same language, that is the language that the brain's going to wire itself for. And then what we start doing is creating maps in the brain. The human brain, once it gets exposed to any language, starts building a map. You can kind of think of that um, as almost like a piano keyboard where you have separate each key of the keyboard has a different tone. On the map, and you'll see that again in a minute, but in this particular slide, you can see this was uh, research done by Mezgarani et al. published in the journal Science just a couple of years ago. And what they did is they actually created that using an electrode, they could test for every single sound, every single speech sound of English, and determine where on this part of the brain that you see that's red, where on the temporal lobe, that particular speech sound was being processed. And what that means is then you have this brain that develops its capacity to perceive the sounds of the native language, then the brain is going to link those sounds to meaningful words and learn grammar and build up those capacities that we think of as language. And it's very hierarchical. So these neural clusters, as I said, are like keys on a piano. And they're very specific. And you'll have neurons that are b neurons and p neurons and d neurons and k neurons. Just like on a piano when you uh, touch a key, it's going to only give you one note. And because of that, that then allows the brain to, to perceive speech easily. And once a child can perceive speech easily, and if you've all had the experience of learning a second language after you were in school, in my case it was French, you remember one of the hardest things to do would be to take a dictation, to hear what the teacher's saying and actually perceive it and then write it down because it sounds a little muddy at first. So if you, if you are able to tune the brain for the sounds of the language and if you can really build up that map, that makes speech perception easier and it makes learning by listening easier. So students are going to be much better able to sit in a classroom, hear the teacher read, hear the teacher talk and be able to process that information. Whereas again, if any of you have taken a foreign language, you know in especially in high school or something, you know you want to see it. That's what you want to do, but young children can't see it. So we want to build up this capacity to perceive the sounds easily and rapidly and, and retune the brain. Now, if you just, because we've talked about how prevalent um, the Hispanic population is as our ELL population, if you just do a comparison of English sounds to Spanish sounds, you'll see that there are a lot of English sounds that just don't even exist in Spanish, like the TH sound in the word the, um, or the Z in the word zip, or the Z in the word pleasure. Those sounds don't even exist. So one of the things we want to do is make sure that the brain can process those sounds specifically. And then we have other sounds, English phonemes, that are similar but a little bit different. So all of you who know Spanish know that the R tends to be trilled uh, in Spanish as opposed to the er, that very, uh, we call it a palatal sound in the English language. And then some of our sounds overlap. So building up this ability to perceive all of the speech sounds and to perceive them easily and to have the brain finely tuned, then is building the brain from the bottom up, just like an infant would build the brain from the bottom up to learn language in the first place. Now, I mentioned that a bilingual brain, that being able to speak two languages is really quite good for the brain. Um, and that's because when people learn another language and when they are able to use it in a fluent way and, and an easy way, they develop cognitive advantages that, that people who are monolingual don't have. And one of those is they improve their ability to multitask because they're constantly going from one language to another. 
Um, it improves their attention. They, uh, they can often pay better attention um, for longer periods of time. And it builds up something we call cognitive control, which all of you would probably think of as self-control, that ability to be focused and to learn on demand. And individuals we've shown, research has shown, who have two languages actually have that capacity to learn on demand and, and build up self-control in a way that's augmented by that second language learning. One of the people who's really researched this quite a bit is Judith Kroll. She is an expert on bilingualism and is the director of the Center of Language Science at Penn State. And one of the things she says is, is that bilinguals, unlike me, for example, who's a monolingual, can keep languages separate while keeping them both available and active in their mind at the same time. And that gets into this multitasking capacity that these students have. Um, and we also know, I said earlier, that that children, that children who have a second language um, are really also telling the brain, if you will, that language is very, very important. The brain devotes a lot more of, the, of its architecture, of its geography to language. And school is all about teachers talking and students listening, especially in the elementary grades, but even when you get into secondary. So these, the, the capacity to be a good learner depends on this, this capacity to have a well-built language structure in the brain, and bilingualism really helps that. Now, this is a study I wanted to share with you because some people think, well, my bilingual students or my ELL students have had exposure to English through television. Their parents may speak the, a foreign language, but they watch TV, they, they see other children sometimes um, on other kinds of of computer activities that where they might be listening to English, but this is a study that was that was done where you have this person teaching young children. You can see the little children over on the left; they're just little kids, very young toddlers, and the woman is teaching them directly with a book. And then the same woman has another group of students that she teaches language using a television a monitor. But the students who had the live instruction with the real person speaking actually developed the the piano keyboard, if you will, for that second language, whereas the students who, who were watching television did not. So we know that TV doesn't really provide a good language model for these students. You will be the ones who provide the good language model. So what are some disadvantages that our English language learners face? Well, in addition to the fact that they have this language barrier to learning that we want to really work on, um, they also have parenting challenges often because many of the parents, um, especially in homes of poverty, uh, are working non-conventional hours. They often work at businesses where they have night shifts or where they may not even know what shift they're going to have from week to week. Um, and we also know that poverty itself affects the way the brain matures and affects the way attentional skills develop and processing skills develop and language. We know from Hart and Risley's research that children from homes of poverty have reduced levels of language exposure. So that combination of poverty and the, the differences in the parenting ability of these parents who are working two, la two jobs sometimes or the unconventional hours can interfere with development of the skills that are so important for school. This is um, some of Kimberly Noble's research, um, and she actually had two studies one that she did in 2005, you can see the data on the right with a big circle around some of the cognitive functions that we see are not maturing as quickly in children of poverty like attentional skills and language skills. Um, and there's also the article I talked about uh, of parents uh, uh, working non-standard hours and that those effects. Now, the question has been for several years, why would poverty affect brain maturation? And one of the 
one of the areas that we've now discovered is that um, what poverty does is it increases stress in the home. And then if you add that the idea that these families sometimes are under additional stress because of working a few jobs, maybe two jobs, uh, the additional stress of a fear of being deported perhaps in some cases, you start, you start complicating the effects of stress in the homes and the, the family life of children um, who are English language learners. And what we know is when you have stress, all of us know this, we've all had the experience of, of having a stressful event occur in our lives and we forget our, we lock our keys in the car, um, we forget, we walk out of the house without our um, wallet or our purse. Um, so we all know that when you're under stress, your, your, your cognitive abilities are kind of shorted out. You're not planning and thinking and organizing the way you normally would. You're kind of um, operating on autopilot and you're just trying to get through the day. And so stress, it looks like, is one of the major factors that does affect children of poverty and does result in um, impairments in learning and memory. And it can be just the stress itself that leads to this this brain that just isn't maturing as quickly in the areas that are helpful for school, like listening and memory and attention. So what are the implications for all of you that are listening? Well, A number one is that English language competence and native language competence are very related. The better the language skills of your students in their native language, the better the second language will be learned. So sometimes we have students that we opt for immersion because we think, well, that's how a baby learns a second language, by being immersed in it. But that may frustrate a student whose native language skills are impaired. Secondly, we know that the evidence right now is that for our middle school students, our secondary students, and even the older students in, in the elementary grades, learning a second language is done more effectively if the child has direct instruction. And the direct instruction should include auditory training on the perceptual differences so they can hear the sounds and perceive them easily because that's going to improve their ability to function in the classroom, to listen on demand in a classroom. But it also should include direct teaching of grammar because it's hard, very hard once you're in a school age to, to be able to figure out the grammar of the second language. And that can be very confusing when you're in a classroom and a teacher uses something like a passive that may not be used in a native language of someone else. The teacher says, um, you know, the boy was hit by the girl. The student may be interpreting that in the way their language would be organized grammatically, that the boy hit the girl, not the boy was hit by. So that can lead to confusion. That can lead to frustration for students if they don't have a good understanding of grammar. The third um, implication that I want you to think about is that the, this idea that the English language learners are also from homes where parents work non-standard hours, where there are homes of poverty or undue stress. And those students are going to need cognitive interventions. You want to include interventions that improve attention. You want to include interventions that build memory skills for those students because that will then get them on par with the students that don't have that if you will, double jeopardy that we've been talking about. And then implications for educators. The fourth consideration is that using two languages is a good thing. So it's a good thing for the brain to go back and forth between the two languages. We talked about Judith Kroll's research, and there's other research that shows that that using Spanish at home and using English in the classroom or using an Asian language at home and using English in the classroom is actually a very good thing. So we want the students to be able to use both languages, and but we do want them obviously to focus on the English language when they're in our classrooms. Now just one other point um, that's important to keep in mind, in many states, 
um, to exit your students out of ELL status, to move them into not requiring ELL services anymore, um, or reclassifying them depends on the student scoring a proficiency threshold on the what's called the access exam. And that access exam then results, if the student does well, results in an automatic reclassification as fully in English proficient. And then they're no longer eligible for um, ELL services per se. So it's important to know that that exists and that also there might be students who do fairly well on the test that you might not feel are learning as well with the English language. You'd like them to continue to have the ELL services or vice versa. So we want to reach that proficiency, but we want the students to be very good learners when that occurs. So that leads to the next question, which is how well is the English language development or and or your RTI uh, working for your, your English language learners. Would you say that your system is working well, most of the students are doing well, things are going okay, but some are still not making progress and, and are not exiting? Um, or would you say, yeah, we really need help, we just aren't seeing growth from our efforts with ELL? So once again, just click that on because that will help, and then just press that Submit button. And we'll see where you all are now. Um, and most of you feel like, yes, it's going OK. Two thirds of you do. Um, but many are still making some limited progress. So I want to talk about ways you can get these students to move faster. And you can get them to reach proficiency um, more quickly. And I know that's why you're here, so, so let's look at that. And what I want to introduce you to is the role of neuroscience technology. Understanding the brain, understanding how the brain builds itself for language, um, and how it builds itself for improving cognitive functions as well, memory functions, attention functions, the ability to perceive speech sounds, the ability to sequence sounds. Um, neuroscientists have been studying that those areas now for 20 years. And what they have done is built technology that can supplement what you do in the classroom with these students. And it can make your ELL initiatives move faster and be more effective with your students. Um, uh, and we can get those students to move through our educational process better. So we like to to think of this as three, three components to what technology can do to augment your excellent English language learning interventions that you're using. Um, it's just going to prepare the brain to hear the sounds better so that it's actually building the capacity to map the brain for the English language so that the brain would be mapped just like an infant's brain would who had heard only English their whole life. Secondly, it, technology, because a computer is sitting in front of a child and because it is a non-judgmental responder, the student can hear and, hear and respond and 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 hear and respond over and over and over and over again in a way you can't do in a classroom, where you have to call on a child, get them to respond, then call on another child. So technology allows you to, to increase the intensity of very specific kinds of activities, like let's say you want to build grammar, and you could say, show me the boy is running, show me the Boys are running. Show me the girl is running. Show me the girls are running. You can build that over and over and over, and the students can just hear that repetitively and respond very quickly so that you can really get a lot of practice in, in a short period of time. And finally, you can with technology. There's technology out there now that has voice recognition software and speech recognition software. Um, reading assistant is an example, I'll talk about that in a minute, where the students can read aloud into the computer, the computer can correct them, can recognize if they got it right, if they mispronounced a word or if they um, didn't, didn't really read the word orally correctly, the computer can correct them and provide guidance. 
So you can have guided oral reading on a computer now. So you can build these three components of preparing the brain, practicing intensively, and guiding oral reading with technology in a way that, that you do in the classroom, but you just do in groups with much less intensity. Um, and just an example of, of that, this is one exercise you can think of as preparing the brain where the, the student is listening to words that we call minimal pairs. They're almost identical, like sip, chip, zip, and dip. So those words only vary by one sound. And again, the computer in an intensive way can say, show me sip. Now show me zip. Now show me chip. Now show me sip. Now show me dip. And the child is practicing over and over and over and over again and building up this, this piano keyboard of the maps in a way you just can't do in a classroom situation as nearly as easily, certainly. And what happens is then that rapid and accurate language processing makes the learning easier. So that what happens is that the students are sitting in classroom, they're learning on demand, they're able to spell more easily, they're reading more quickly and easily, they're writing, and they're just progressing more quickly. All you're doing is supplementing what you're doing. You're just taking all of your excellent programs and just augmenting them with half an hour on a computer every day. Um, and that, again, as I said, a computer allows for intensity of practice, and the computer can have guided oral reading as well, where the student, using something like a program called Reading Assistant, actually sees the words on the computer, reads them into the computer. They can hear it read first. They can then see it and read it aloud and then have it correct them or have it guide them if they're having a little bit of trouble. So what is the research? <laughs> Show me the results. Um, just so you know, What Works Clearinghouse rated the Fast Forward Language Program, which is a computerized program that builds grammar skills, builds vocabulary, and builds its capacity to perceive the speech sounds as the top effectiveness of all of the related interventions for improving English language that um, involve very specific uh, products. And we have data from school districts where we have students who are bilingual, um, English language learners compared to all students in general. This is from Arizona with, as you know, a very high proportion of students who are English language learners. And you can see that the elementary, on the right-hand side, you can see the elementary students, K to 5, the middle school students, um, grade 6 to 8, and the high school students, 9 to 13, all showed actual significant improvements in their English language skills as a result of just, in many cases, a semester of these computerized interventions that were added to the, the general curriculum for ELL students. So with that, we will stop, um, and I'll take questions. But just want to keep this slide on to say to you that after this webinar, um, what I'm going to have you do is request that you fill out the survey. That helps us to understand if this was helpful to you and if there's anything else we can provide in the way of webinars that you would like or other information. Um, when you um, also, when you get your survey, you're also going to receive an email with links to these slides. So you can actually have them. You can use them yourself um, and talk about them. You'll get a recording of the session, and you'll get a certificate of attendance that you can use for your professional education. Um, and then you'll also have an option to request more information to see how you can build English Fast with your ELL students this year. So I'm going to leave this slide on. And Carrie, I'm just going to see if we have any questions that came up. We do. Um, so that was a great presentation, Dr. Burns. And the first question that came in said that um, they have some, um, let's see here, 15 and 16-year-olds who were in second and third grade in their home country. Uh, they came to the US, and we placed them in ninth grade. Um, 
do we need to teach grammar if they don't have their the basics in their first language? Um, kind of what do we do with these students, I think, is the general question. Wow, that's a tough question because, and a very mm -hmm. good question, because those students are are obviously going to struggle if they if they're you know placed in a higher grade than the than the language skills that they have and i would say yes you do need to teach them grammar because most of what's going to go on in a classroom is going to be going way over their head um, i can only imagine what would happen to me if because i probably have about a third grade level of french comprehension if somebody put me in a sixth or seventh grade french class um, most of what would happen in that classroom, most of the reading materials we would have, most of the content would be over my head. So those students are going to want to teach grammar, but you're also going to want to teach academic vocabulary. Um, and again, you want to build their listening skills. I would, I would definitely want to put them on a program that builds up their language skills so they can process the language that's going on around them faster in the classroom. Okay, and the next question that came in is, what is meant by cognitive interventions? You had mentioned that about halfway through. Oh, good question. Yes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes educators use cognitive a little different than neuroscientists do. When, when neuroscientists use the term cognitive interventions, they're talking about improving very specific skills, like attention skills and memory skills. There's one specific kind of memory we call working memory, for example, which is the capacity to, uh, if you think about it as a teacher, uh, instructing your students, it's the capacity to hear what the teacher says and hold that in mind for the rest of the class period so that, or if you're reading a book, to when you're on page one to hold the content and the characters and the scenery of page one in mind when you get to page 75. Working memory means then you're holding the memory and you're keeping it in mind. It's not exactly long, it's not long-term memory and it's, it's much longer than what we might think of as short-term memory, working memory. And that can be trained. And a lot of people don't realize that. They think, well, some people are good at memory skills and some aren't. But actually, there's quite a bit of research that shows you can train working memory skills. And when, that, when you do that, um, students are able to sit in a classroom and remember what the teacher said and, and carry that information through the whole period and keep it in mind. Um, and then attention skills. We all have students who are inattentive. Um, often students who have inattentiveness and some hyperactivity are placed on medications, but it turns out we have a huge body of research from many different universities and from neuroscientists showing that you can train attention. You can actually improve a child's ability to attend without medicating them. And then you also can train children to perceive speech sounds. So all of those, that's called processing. All of that would fall under what we would call cognitive skills in the neuroscience world um, that teachers don't teach directly. Teachers directly teach content, teach how to read, teach how to do math problems, teach science, social studies. But, it, but building the capacity to learn is, is what you can train through, through cognitive skill interventions. Okay, so this was a really good question that came in. When an older student shows up with no literacy in their first language, um, would it be a good idea to find their native language level and work from there in their native language as they learn English? What would that's, you recommend? In wow, that that's a $64,000 question. And you, whoever asked that may know that bilingual specialists have been struggling with that for a long time. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm also a speech language pathologist and we have two. So if we have a child who has, let's say, a language problem in their native language, their, their native language is just not even age level. Um, and they don't have basic grammatical skills and their vocabulary is level, level is low. Would we be better to teach them their first language and then build the second language on it? Now the problem with that is from the standpoint of the human brain, that makes sense. But from the standpoint of these students having to compete um, on our testing within our schools and being able to learn in the classroom, we don't have the luxury of doing that. So
So one of the things that that we recognize in education is we want the parents to know the importance of their native language. We do want to identify the students who have a learning disability in their native language so they can get the extra help that they need in, in their native language. But we also need this intensive um, approach to teaching English for them at the same time so that they can benefit from the classroom. Okay, and here's another question. Can you give an example of an exercise that can be used in the classroom to train students to improve working memory? Talk a little bit maybe about more about Fast Forward. Yeah, well, we could talk about Fast Forward. Fast Forward is, is, is a neuroscience-based intervention that has um, each of the units of Fast Forward. There are several different programs. Um, but each one of them bombards children with working memory tasks. But, uh, and that's certainly something you can do, and then you don't have to do it in the classroom. But just to give you an example of what you do in the classroom that builds working memory skills is if you are teaching content in a certain area, and then after you finish, let's say, with a section for 10 minutes, you then ask every student in the class questions about what you just said. Um, uh, what did I say about who discovered America and what did I say, what was the year? And you go back and ask them questions about the content. That is actually exercising working memory. If any reading comprehension tasks are exercising working memory, if the child understands the language, if they don't understand the language, all you're doing is frustrating them. And just so you all know, just the activities you do that, that are working memory activities, the game concentration is a working memory activity where you have to keep all the cards that have been turned over in your head and remember where they were as you go through the task. But the nice thing is we now have technology that does that. You don't have to do those kinds of exercises in the classroom. You can actually utilize technology that does it for you. Okay, so last question today, because I do want to keep to our 45-minute uh, time frame that we had uh, promised. Um, I've got a teacher here who is asking me, she teaches uh, five- and six-year-olds, um, and she's wondering if that is too young uh, to get to these kids who are um, definitely ELL students. I would so say again, the five younger and you start, the, yeah, the younger you start, the better. The earlier mm -hmm. you introduce okay. the second language, the better. It just is easier for okay. the brain. The brain is more plastic the younger a child is. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, okay, well, that's great. If we did not get to your question, I know we had several uh, remaining here, please email us at webinars at scilearn.com. Uh, we will also be sending out a link to the recording, a link to the certificate of attendance, and a link to the presentation slides, so you'll be getting those in the next day or two. Um, again, we are back tomorrow with another webinar called How to Rewire uh, the Brain, and that will be tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. So if you want to join us for that, feel free, and um, we will hopefully either see you tomorrow or we'll see you again online soon. So th again, thank you so much, Dr. Burns, and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.